Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Pieces of China, which tells the story of China one object at a time. On the day before Earth Day, we are especially thrilled to have Wendy Paulson with us. Wendy is a nature educator, a conservation activist, and the chairman of the Bobolink Foundation, which supports conservation projects around the world. Wendy's going to talk today about the spoon-billed sandpiper, which is one of the most endangered birds in the world with only 600 re remaining, I think something like that she'll share with us um, in the world. And so um, let's get right to it. So welcome, Wendy. Why don't you turn on your camera and unmute yourself? We are so okay. happy to have you with us today, Wendy. Welcome. Thanks so, Wendy, a lot. And it's great to be here. Great. So, Wendy, why did you choose to talk about the spoon-billed sandpiper today? Tell us a little bit about this bird and what does it have to do with China? Okay, doke. Well, first of all, I'm really glad you chose a, um, a, a bit of nature for your Pieces of China series right before Earth Day. Um, nature has always figured so largely in Chinese art and literature and you know, it's always been a very important part of the culture. And I, I chose the spoon-billed sandpiper. It was an easy choice for me. It's not probably well, as well known as the cranes of Chinese art and so forth, but it is a bird that has a very close and important connection with China. Um, it's a bird that's on the, it's a shorebird. It's a small shorebird. It's about the size of a, of a, of a sparrow, uh, weighing about one ounce, <laughs> um, but it, it is on the brink of extinction. As you said, there, there are varying estimates of its numbers anywhere between 200, 600, something like that. Um, and its future is tied inextricably with the future of the Chinese coasts, China's coast on the Yellow Sea. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, Take a look at the map. We've got a map here so we can, there we go. Oh, great. Okay, good. Yeah, it, it is it's one of of many species of shorebirds um, that make epic journeys every year. They have been doing this for eons um, and they follow what is called the Austral East Asia Australasian Flyway. Um, and you can see where it extends all the way down from New Zealand, Australia up to uh, Siberia and Russia and the United States. Now the spoon-billed sandpipers uh, range isn't quite that far but it does nest in far Northeastern Russia and it spends the winter in Southeast Asia, including part of Southern China. Um, but the heart of its migration, which it takes place twice each year in the spring and in the fall, is along the coast of China on the great mudflats of the Yellow Sea. And uh, for that reason, it's, it's kind of an iconic species. We'll talk a little bit about that, just what it's facing. Um, another reason I chose it is that it's the spoon-billed sandpiper has great eye appeal. <laughs> it's um, it, so adorable. It, um, it, uh, it, it, you can hardly avoid the word cute and even adorable. <laughs> exactly. um, it's pint-sized, uh, looks like just a, a normal strawberry until, until you see this bill, this totally improbable bill um, that has a spatula-shaped tip to it. Mm -hmm. And it's the only uh, shorebird of its uh, that that has that type of bill. So mm -hmm. when you see one, you kind of go, oh, <laughs> it's kind of a gas. It's yeah. um, so just a, a really great bird, and then the fact that it's so rare. So mm -hmm. that's why I chose the spoon-billed sandpiper. Right. Before we get to the question of how you first uh, learned about it, I just wanted to highlight before we move on from the migration, just how incredible that migration is. Just that at the age of two weeks or something like that. Um, their parents have already flown off from Russia, and yet they are able to take off and fly thousands of miles, right, to China. To, to, right. I mean, it's just, it's, it's one of nature's incredible uh, miracles. It is. It's, it, it, it is absolutely miraculous. I call it epic, miraculous. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a feat that I didn't really know about until I was an adult. Um, I didn't grow up knowing about these birds. Um, and, and this has been going on, as I said, for eons, mm -hmm. um, but without guidance, without a map, without, you know, they take off and, and do this on their own. And yeah. it's something that scientists are still probing um, the, you know, what enables them to do it, and do it uh, successfully every year. Tell us how you first learned about the spoon-billed sandpiper and when, and then also tell us when you first saw one. Okie doke. Well, I probably had, I, I'm sure I'd, I knew about the Span, Sand Hills <laughs> Spoonbilled Sandpiper. I'd seen images of it, um, but I kind of, I really didn't think that 
I probably would see one. It's on the other side of the world. It's extremely rare. And then in, I think it was 2013, I attended a BirdLife um, World Congress, uh, the big, big, uh, big conference uh, in Ottawa, Canada. And one of the speakers was a young 12 year old Chinese girl, uh, Tina Lin, who spoke to over 400 people in her in a second language about her awakening to the bird world. And she focused largely on the spoon-billed sandpiper and showed photos um, of ones that she had seen. And she spoke about how she had come to love these birds almost as much as I love my mother. And oh, she, she had people in the audience in tears. <laughs> she, and that was the first time that I felt, oh gosh, I really want to see this bird too. <laughs> so that was kind of the beginning. And one year later, I uh, went to China, um, actually visited with uh, uh, Tina and her mom, um, and then wow. flew up to the uh, Jiangsu province um, to join a couple of uh, spoonbilled sandpiper experts uh, to look for them. And it was with my husband, Hank. And it had to be the most wretched day for bird watching you can possibly <laughs> The wind was howling, the rain was driving. We had to go out onto these mud flats. We, we had donned full uh, rain suits, got into rubber boots, sloshed our way out, tripping and falling. I, we were all covered with mud, no success. <laughs> Came back. lost our boots um you know we got finally got them on again but it was it was just a, a mud bath and got everybody was freezing cold as well got back to the seawall and um uh Zhang Lin who was uh just a just an outstanding um bird leader and expert in China he was still he was just just determined to find one and he's using his scope said, I've got one I've got one and I got to the scope <laughs> Yes, I could see a bird that looked a little bit different than the others and all the red stints and everything surrounding it. But could I really say that I'd seen one well? Absolutely not. I could say that, yes, I'd seen one. Um, but I, but as a, as a longtime birder, it was not a very authentic sighting. Um, but I went back again three years later and spent time again with Lin and Jing. And that time we were up in Taozini, um, also in the Jiangsu, mm -hmm. and uh, we saw, I think the total was seven spoon-billed sandpipers, but the, oh, the wow. best was one that I actually identified myself. And that's the one that I won't forget because oh, it's one goodness. thing somebody showing you and you know finding the scope, getting in the scope, having you, but then I kept, kept I was just so determined and kept looking myself. And there, um, so that was the, the story of the first sighting. <laughs> Fabulous. Congratulations. Um, so why is the spoon-billed sandpiper so terribly threatened? What's happened to its habitat in China? I love, okay. by the way, I have to say, these photographs, fabulous photographs, are taken by Paulson Institute's very wonderful Shi Jianbin and by Wendy Paulson herself. So I think this is Shi Jianbin's photo, but go ahead. Why, what's, what's the habitat problem? Okay, well, I'm gonna just say, first of all, it probably never was super common because it has a narrow um, breeding area up in Northeast Russia. It has a, uh, a very uh, confined wintering area on the coast of Southeast, a coast of Southeast Asia. Um, and then also this narrow band of, of migration in this route. Um, but uh, what has happened is as, is on that migration route. Um, the heart of the migration is the Yellow Sea coastline. And that has, it's, it's China has the largest, uh, most productive mud flats in the world. Um, just, it just it's, it's, it's astonishing when you see them. But what has happened in the recent decades has been what you euphemistically called reclamation. And the mud flats have been transformed um, basically into commercial and industrial real estate. So mm -hmm. it's often, a, this photograph doesn't give a sense, it's often a surreal experience. Right to your left shoulder, you know, are belching smokestacks and, and huge machinery and, and that sort of thing. And so every year these mudflats are shrinking and all the invertebrates that they provide for nourishment for these birds. Um, and you know, it's it's as the as the mudflats shrink, as the the food supply shrinks, the the number of birds shrinks as well. And right. so the the 
Spoonbill Sandpiper has its numbers have just plummeted um, in the last few decades. Um, and fortunately, there there are scientists in in all the countries where they have where they touch down um, that are that are working for their survival. But it has been a very sharp, steep decline. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say just one thing about this just this photo because I have never experienced. Um, a spectacle like the shorebirds um, on the on the Yellow Sea. It is one I, I call it the, sort of the Serengeti <laughs> of you know eastern of, of the China coast. It, right. It's just it's awesome. It it just you can't help but just be filled with this um, thrill. Uh, it, it just awe. Uh, it, it is you use the word miraculous a bit for it is it's just a miracle and um, that these birds are traveling thousands and thousands of miles and looking for um, nourishment as you know as they as they go from the um, southern end of their flyway to the northern end um, and it's and it's tragic when they can't find what they need on this right. in between so that's right. why it's and then yeah. I should also say that they've also the other the other threat that the spoonbilled sandpiper has faced um, is illegal uh, trapping and hunting, um, and especially in its in its wintering grounds. Yep, I should add that this particular photograph is not the spoonbilled sandpiper, and and there are many many other species that are also. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, there aren't that many spoonbilled sandpipers in the world. <laughs> no, exactly. But there are many other species that are also enduring this this um, uh, you know shrinking of habitat and and facing very difficult times. So the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the Paulson Institute have been working on conservation on the habitat. Habitat. So, um, and I'm very proud to say that I was, I had the honor of working with Paulson Institute um, as you were working on it. Uh, has there been progress? Yes, um, because as I said, scientists uh, for years have been documenting um, the, the status and the decline of the Spoonsville Sandpiper. Um, the Paulson Institute partnered with the Chicago, the, uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences to develop a blueprint for the conservation and management of these wetland sites. They, they identified more than 150 sites and then prioritized them. The progress, the good news is that just three years ago in 2018, the Chinese government issued a moratorium on reclamation on, on the coast of Jiangsu province. Um, and that was followed by more good news in 2019 when I think it was 11 or 12 of the most critical sites were uh, uh, recognized as world heritage um, sites, which gives them a, 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 a much stronger uh, form of protection. Um, and there are management plans being developed for those places now. And it's it's people like this is Jing Li from the Spoonbilled Sandpiper um, in China. Um, it's part of the, the network. There's a whole network throughout the East uh, Asia, Australasia flyway. Uh, and it's it's people like Jing, like Zhang Lin, um, who have really propelled uh, the awareness of this bird. And speaking of awareness, um, I know the next slide shows some of the educational work that's being done just to bring it into the classrooms for young kids. Oh, uh, the highlights of two of my trips in 2017 and 18, I think we're visiting, was visiting schools, um, you know, one in Rudong, I think the other was in uh, Dongling or near Dongling, mm -hmm. um, where, uh, the Spoonbilled Sandpiper uh, in China, that, that, that group, that's an NGO, um, has developed relationships with the schools and the, the bird has become a focus of the whole art program and sort of a, a mascot for the schools. And those kids not only interpret the bird in all sorts of art forms, you can see some of them here, cool. um, but they also make trips. They they take field trips to go look for um, both this, this what they call the spoonie um, and other shorebirds, other iconic, other other uh, these long distance migrants. Um, and they they they're going to become ambassadors. I mean, that's one of the most hopeful things I think. And that uh, they also uh, Jing's group also has a traveling van that that sort of provides a road show. Um, that moves around the province. Here are some of the, the children we, we actually moved inland for um, an afternoon just to look at, at sites, at, at look at birds and look at, at birding sites and so forth. And I, it's one of the, always one of the most favorite parts of my trips there. <laughs> one of the things that I think we so often forget about China is that China is made up of people who are often doing very, very wonderful things to promote positive change. So um, 
this is just a wonderfully inspiring example of that. But um, so the other thing is that there's been this incredible rise of bird lovers in China who are kind of driving a new environmental movement and, and working so hard to protect the birds. So talk about that a little bit. Has that been inspiring been, you? Bird watching has, been, has exploded in China. And just the, the whole grassroots movement of, of love of nature, um, desire to protect nature um, has just come so far. And that's, what's, that's what gives me the most hope um, because uh, everywhere I went in China, there were um, not only uh, academicians and scientists, but a lot of volunteers um, that are doing everything they can to bring attention to these declining species. And the, the spoonbilled sandpiper is the one that has galvanized um, attention just because it is so, so endangered. And you get a sense from these slides, just the, the vastness of the, of the mud flats. And you can sometimes not even tell the difference between where the mud ends and the sky begins or the sea begins. It's just, it's just one vast thing, you know, this one you can, but the, the pre previous one, very difficult because it's just a, a vast panorama of gray. And the volunteers, I mean, I just feel such a kinship with them because I work in a largely uh, volunteer driven conservation initiatives in, in the US. Um, they care just the, exactly the same we do about our places. They care about their places and are doing everything they can um, to bring attention uh, to others um, and to bring uh, protection and conservation to those species. This is one of the things that's so wonderful about the work that you do, Wendy, because you are very much a grassroots person. You work really at the grassroots and um, it's, it's very inspiring to see and you connect to these people who are really, um, you know, kind of building, you know, inch by inch building a new society. Well, they're um, my, they re really are my heroes. I mean, it takes that grassroots and I think it's just as, if not even more important in China for that to happen um, yes, along yes. with the policies, you know, from the government. And I might just suggest, uh, mention this, right in the foreground of this uh, picture is, um, a U.S. writer, Scott Widensall, who I was with um, the, the last time I went, he has just published, has just come out, his book called um, A World on the Wing, and the opening chapter is called Spoonies, and oh. it's a great documentation of the the natural history of spoonbilled sandpipers, its status, um, it, its rarity, the challenges, all of that. Um, he's yeah. just a terrific book. And we, will, we, will, we will send the name of that book around in our, um, you know, post post program uh, thank you notes, so that people have that have that uh, title they can look up. Um, and one other thing you should, should include, if or if people can just look it up, if you look up spoonbill sandpiper videos, yeah. um, Garrett Vin of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has taken the most astonishing video of spoonbill sandpipers on their nesting grounds. Well, and Cornell has done unbelievable work on this stuff too. So that's wonderful. Great. Um, so Wendy, I guess a final question. Unfortunately, we're close to the end of our time, but are you feeling they're still they're still up against such terrible odds, the spoonbilled sandpiper and all these other important migratory species? Um, are you feeling optimistic or pessimistic at this moment? I, 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 it's a term that's used an awful lot, but I guess I'd say I've got cautious optimism. <laughs> um, the uh, I mean the 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 stopping of the the reclamation, uh, the world heritage status, those are all great um, kind of milestones, building blocks, but the vigilance just has to continue. Um, we all know, you know, we, we have our own national parks and so forth, but there's always pressure and there will continue to be pressure. Um, very few people know about these birds and particularly this one, <laughs> um, you know, they've, and if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. And, um, but the fact that there is such a burgeoning um, uh, grassroots movement in China to bring attention to these species gives me hope. Uh, because once people know about something and learn to love it the way Tina learned to love the student sandpiper, mm -hmm. then they're going to do something to help protect it. Right. So beautifully put. Thank you, Wendy. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, we could talk forever and ever, and I'm going to next time bring you back to talk about the bar-tailed godwit. But... <laughs> 
I am no ornithological expert, Dinda. I love another it. wonderful bird. But um, thank you so much, Wendy, for helping us tell the story of China. And yeah. um, I want to thank the audience for tuning in and hope that you join us again. Our next Pieces of China um, episode is going to be with an expert, a historian, talking about the Yongle Emperor in the Ming Dynasty and the city that he built. So that will be another very, very interesting one. Um, and um, as always, please join as members because your membership, uh, you get great discounts, but more importantly, you help us bring brilliant speakers like Wendy Paulson to our, our screen and our stage. So again, Wendy, thank you for helping us tell the story of China. Thanks, Dinda. Great to be with you. So great to have you.